All right, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about MySQL high availability and how that's looking uh, in 2021. Uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Pete Sylvester. I'm uh, from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, probably much like a few other people in this call. Um, I've been working with databases for a little bit over 20 years now, uh, specifically largely working uh, in MySQL specifically. I work for a company called Pythian. Uh, we have uh, a number of slides and slogans, which are absolutely amazing. Uh, but today, we haven't come to talk about that. We've come to talk about high availability uh, and what we're currently recommending for a number of our clients who are working with native replication in MySQL. Uh, we're going to be covering four main components, which is going to be MySQL, Orchestrator, Proxy SQL, and Console. And we'll follow up at the end if, uh, if we have time for some questions and a quick live demo, which obviously will not fail. Um, in our agenda, I just want to make sure we have a couple of quick disclaimers. First one is that this is usually a fairly lengthy training process. Uh, when I do this with our clients, usually this is a two-day training course. The main content of it is roughly about seven hours long, but we're going to compress that down to give you the high-level concepts so you're at least familiar with the stack uh, and at least have a launching point where you can go start Googling and try to uh, include this in your production environment. Um, just wanted to also offer one other disclaimer. Uh, there is a major move in the MySQL community to move away from the terms master and slave when it comes to replication. I'm fully in support of this. I may switch back and forth between the two terms. It's more kind of like a old habits die hard kind of thing. So uh, you may, I may say source, I may say master, I may say replica, I may say slave. There are also some images in these slides that are a little dated and it says I was too lazy to update them, but the reality is, is I did run a little short on time. So just wanted to make sure there was no confusion there. So let's talk a little bit about our high availability objective. And this is something that's really important considering that in the past, we really just wanted to have an environment that was available uh, and able to be reached, for, particularly when it comes to write traffic. But one thing that's becoming more common now, especially due to what players like AWS and Google Cloud are doing uh, with their database as a service platform is we just wanna have a singular front end endpoint where the application can go and it can make data requests. And so far as the application or our clients are concerned, they don't care what happens once you get past the endpoint. They just want to have an endpoint they can reach and have it reliably serve their data requests. So that's our client's perspective. Just have that single endpoint, make sure my data requests work. From our perspective of the individuals who are implementing this type of solution, we're just looking to establish that endpoint and handle everything that comes back from that into the data platform, specifically looking to eliminate individual single points of failure. So in the past, I have been criticized that I get too deep into the details without discussing the solution as a whole. So we're just gonna take a little one minute break here and just introduce the entire concept and then get into the details. So first off, let's go ahead and introduce our technologies. We have MySQL, which is obviously gonna be serving as the data serving portion of our data platform. It's usually going to be replicated. It's going to have at least one writer. I mean, typically you could, but shouldn't have multiple. But in this case, we're going to have one writer and we're going to have multiple readers acting as our source and replicas, uh, respectively. And we're going to have orchestrator, which will be acting as what we call a replication manager. So it will be actively parsing the replication environment. It will allow you to manage that however you see fit. It will react to disasters and do its absolute best to recover from them, simply just rearranging the replication topology. We'll be working with console, which will be acting as our key value store, which will just hold information about the current state of our replication topology, as in which one is the source, which ones are the replicas. And finally, we'll be working with proxy SQL, which will be acting as that final endpoint and being a proxy down into our database solution, uh, specifically down into MySQL. As we go through this, you're gonna notice that our topology metadata flow will start with MySQL itself because it is the source that is replicating. Orchestrator will be actively polling MySQL for information and pulling it into its own space. As updates are done, it will push information into console and its key value store. And then subsequently, other processes will take data from console and update it proxy SQL uh, in a very, very short period of time, almost immediate, 
a little bit of a lag, you know, because obviously you have to wait for communication, but usually you're not going to see any kind of interruption with proxy SQL when it comes to your application requests with this solution. Taking a look at this in a handy dandy diagram, we see here in the center we have our MySQL solution. It's being actively monitored and interacted with by orchestrator and console, which is working together in clusters. And then they send metadata about the state of the replication topology up to proxy SQL. From the application's perspective, it goes to proxy SQL. Proxy SQL has the configuration that's representative of that of the current state of the replication topology, and then pushes that down into MySQL. <clears throat> so let's talk about meeting our objectives of eliminating single points of failure. And let's start with MySQL. So we don't have orchestrator, no console, no proxy SQL. We have just a single source. We have a couple replicas. Uh, and this is representative of even some techno uh, to some stacks that we see in production these days, you know, where things are a little bit dated I and mean, we don't have the, the proper high availability solutions in place. And as you may have guessed, our single point of failure is that with our source server. If the source server goes down, your application will be at the very least degraded, if not uh, completely halted at this point, because it doesn't really have the ability to handle writes unless it goes to a situation where it's split brain among the replicas, taking them out of read only, so on and so forth. But it's generally pretty easily agreed upon that if your master goes down, uh, you're usually in a lot of trouble. So we need to have something that's going to respond to that. And in comes Orchestrator. So Orchestrator was developed by Shlomi Nowak. Uh, formerly of GitHub. Uh, he has moved on from that uh, now that GitHub has been purchased by Microsoft. And Orchestrator is one of these uh, MySQL tools that was for the community by the community. Uh, it hands a very, very uh, unique interface in the sense that it actually has something that's uh, graphical, where a large majority of the tools that we're using are still obviously coming off of uh, the command line interface. You can see some of, uh, some of what that looks like right here, but we're going to be doing a demo later on, so you can see in a little bit more detail. Uh, but by and large, it's there to rep manage your replication environment. It can change the topology. It can handle promotions. You can even do things just like starting and stopping replication on individual replicas, right? Um, so all these features are really great. So you can go in here, you can make all these manual changes, but when it's three o'clock in the morning and somebody's not sitting there at the terminal, it doesn't really help you all that much if your master goes down, right? You need to have something that has the ability to respond to disasters and recover the environment in a highly available fashion. And Orchestrator does have that feature. You can set it to automatically recover the environment. And what's very interesting about Orchestrator is the approach and, what it, and, and how it goes about this. And they refer to this uh, as a holistic recovery. So I would have to compare this to previous high availability platforms and I'll just uh, I'll go with MHA for an example. So MHA is a previous high availability tool had the option to monitor your source server. And in the case that it went down, it would also handle replication recovery. But it gave you the option to provide an alternate network path to your source. This was largely to deal with network partitioning issues because if you had a situation where there was a network problem between your MHA node and the source of your replication topology, you wanted to make sure it wasn't just a network problem. So you could configure something saying, hey, I want you to go through this other subnet, go through this other switch or this other network, and I want you to just verify that the source is actually down before you take any action that would be potentially destructive otherwise to bring the system back online. Orchestrator also does the same thing, but it uses the replicas for this purpose. So when it detects that the source server is down, the first thing is it does is it goes and it pulls it once or twice. It says, OK, the, the source server is down, at least so far as I know. Now I'm going to go to all of the replicas that are directly attached to it and say, hey, what do you see? And if it comes back and says, hey, um, I don't see what's going on with the, the source. Uh, I'm running show, uh, show replica status, and it's showing that I don't have any connectivity into the source server. At this point, it says, okay, well, I can't see it. None of the replicas can see it. So obviously, we have a situation where a disaster has been interpreted, and now it's the time to react. And you'll notice I put one little footnote here. 
One thing that it will handle for you if configured is it will automatically configure things like read only and you can even set it to uh, work with other MySQL options as well. But read only is really the one that's the most pertinent if we're talking about the high level details, because obviously you want to make sure your source server is writable and you want to make sure your replicas are read only. This is going to come up a little bit later, so I wanted to make sure we're aware of this. So obviously, if we have orchestrator as the item that's uh, monitoring our replication topology and responding to failures in a holistic way, isn't it now the single point of failure? Well, what happens if orchestrator goes down? Well, it does have a couple of features uh, that help you get around this. Basically, it's clustering. Uh, one of the two ways of going about this is that you can set multiple orchestrator hosts up to use a single backend, because obviously the orchestrator host needs to have its own metadata. So you could have MySQL or a Galera solution sitting underneath it where it can go to and say, hey, you know, what's the current state? And then it can go and update its metadata. So now you have this option of having multiple orchestrator hosts working in tandem using a single backend so it can maintain that state as one host takes over where a previous may have failed. It's a good solution, but my preference is the next one, which is simply the orchestrator raft cluster. So you can have multiple orchestrator hosts working together in a cluster using the raft consensus protocol, which allows one of your hosts to act as a leader of the cluster and have other ones acting as followers. The leader is going to be the one that's going to interact with your MySQL replication topology, but as it makes changes or as it interprets new changes like the appearance of a new replica, for example, it'll say, hey, I know it. It's now in my back end. Now I'm going to send logs off to the followers via the raft protocol, and now they all have the, uh, the information as well and they can go ahead and update their backend. So now we've removed that single data source as a backend, uh, as a single point of failure, sorry. And now we have it distributed across all of the nodes that are acting in our orchestrator raft. So before we move on, I know I've thrown a lot of information out there. Does anybody have any questions about orchestrator before we move on to the next technology? I'll go I've ahead. Heard. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, does it work with uh, statement-based or row-based? So it works with statement-based, it works row-based, it works with GTID, it works without GTID, and it also has an option where it can use pseudo GTID. So my recommendation just in general is to go with row-based because it's going to allow you to work with better parallel replication, uh, which is more of a performance thing, not really tied directly to high availability. But yes, to answer your question, it will work with uh, different forms of uh, binary logging. Yep. Okay. Okay. So I'll move on to our next technology. We're going from orchestrator, we're going all the way to the other side of the stack, and we're going to be talking a little bit about proxy SQL. Uh, proxy SQL, again, a great uh, for the community by the community tool. Uh, it is very, very oriented for database administrators. It is a layer seven proxy. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the OSI model, which I figure most of you probably are, but just a quick refresher, layer seven means we're up at the application layer. Now, uh, in contrast, something like um, HA proxy op operating in HTTP mode would be layer seven as well. Uh, if you have something like HA proxy working in TCP mode, it's going to be at layer four. But when people say, hey, this is a layer seven proxy, we mean it's serving as an application, right? So it understands MySQL in the sense that it interprets SQL, it can read SQL, parse it. Not only that, but it's using tables and stuff like that to make its configuration very, very user friendly for those with a database background, right? So not only that, but you have the opportunity to group MySQL servers together and it can parse the environment and say, hey, I understand that you are all part of a cluster. Your read-only flag is turned off, so obviously you're my source host and all the rest of you have your read-only flag turned on, so obviously you're my replicas. And obviously that will never, ever, ever bite you. Never, obviously. We won't come back to that later or anything, but it's just to say that it does have those features built in as well as a multitude of other features such as proxy side query caching, uh, query revision, multiplexing, connection pooling, uh, so on and so forth. They even do some very basic monitoring, which can be very helpful if you don't have something like console acting as an intermezzo in this case. But uh, just to say that this is a very, very feature-rich solution. And out of, I think, the last 
six projects that we've had where we've implemented the solution and for a client, all but one of them went with proxy SQL. We're seeing a lot of industry adoption there. Typically when it's implemented in your solution, it's gonna be one of two ways. Uh, you can either have a single proxy SQL node or a series of proxy SQL nodes acting as a layer between your application and your MySQL backend. Or one thing that we're seeing people implement about half the time is actually having proxy SQL installed on the application host itself. So the host goes and it connects to proxy SQL locally, which then forwards the connection onto the MySQL server based on the state of replication topology and whatever kind of load balancing configuration you happen to have implemented. So next question obviously then becomes, how do we avoid having proxy SQL as our single point of failure? There are a few ways of going about this, but in the interest of saving time, I'll note that one of the more common ways of, the, uh, of going about this is by implementing proxy SQL clustering. So you can have several proxy SQL servers. They all operate as a cluster. They're sharing data about things like your MySQL servers, MySQL users, and whatever query rules you have in place. Because remember, it's able to parse queries, which means it can actually handle routing based on the content of the query itself. So you need to have a good lengthy set of regular expression driven rules in order to drive features like that. So if one receives an update on that, it wants to make sure all the rest of its neighbors have that. Now, one very important distinction, and this is not using the RAF consensus protocol. There is a current feature on the roadmap for proxy SQL to implement that. Uh, but the, for those of you who are familiar, um, I would say that the clustering mechanisms used by proxy SQL are very similar to what you might see with uh, gossip protocols and Cassandra for things like um, handling schema changes uh, or dealing with uh, gossip snitch, that type of thing, right? So you have one, it communicates with its neighbor, then it communicates with its neighbor, so on and so forth. Eventually, we are hoping for a more robust so solution that will include things like Raft, right? Uh, so before we move on to the next portion of this, does anybody have any questions about proxy SQL? Okay. Let's talk about that intermezzo. We have proxy SQL, we have orchestrator, they're both working in tandem with your MySQL replication topology. Neither of these know about each other. Orchestrator is going through and it's making updates, it's moving hosts around in the case of a disaster, it's making changes to the systems via the read-only flag or other configurable variables, right? So it's making these changes. Similarly, Proxy SQL is monitoring the environment, it knows what servers belong in the cluster, and it's reading those flags to determine which one's the source and which ones are the replicas. And just a quick note here, you do need to have a monitoring user established for this. It's one of the things that's fairly obvious, but we do like to point that out where we can. The problem here, and I've made reference to this a few times earlier in the presentation, the problem with this and the fact that they're not communicating together, you can get a situation edge case, but you can get a situation where you have a split brain. And this is really, really bad. So let me walk you through the scenario. Let's say you have a four server replication cluster, one source, three replicas. In this situation, we're properly setting our read-only flag. Our source is read-only off, our replicas are read-only on. Proxy SQL can interpret this and easily determine what the state of the replica replication topology is. But let's say the source server becomes partitioned at the network la layer. None of the orchestrator hosts can see it. None of the replicas can see it. Proxy SQL can't see it. We can see the other replicas for some strange reason, but we can't see the source itself. Orchestrator using its holistic approach is gonna to go to the replicas and it's gonna say, hey, I, I can't see the source server. How about you? And it's going to, they're all gonna come back and be like, well, we can't see the source server either. It now decides to take action. It takes one of the replicas and promotes it to a source. It changes the other replicas to replicate from the new source, it takes the new source and turns off its read-only flag. Time passes. Eventually, the network partition situation resolves itself. The fourth server, which was the original source, now comes back online. Orchestrator never manipulated this host. It was unreachable. It could, you know, we could never do anything with it from anywhere. So its read-only flag is still off. 
and it's still part of the replication host group. So now proxy SQL says, oh, there's four hosts. Two of them are read-only turned off. So obviously my situation is that I can load balance my right traffic between these two hosts. And this is uh, the, the short term that we use for this in the database world is just bad. Um, so obviously we wanna make sure we're avoiding a situation of where data consistency at a cluster level, uh, we, we wanna make sure that's uh, not compromised basically at all costs. So how do we take away the situation and get orchestrator and proxy SQL talking to one another? And there's a few options on the table. One thing that a lot of people like to use is hooks. Um, you know, a lot of different solutions out there are leveraging hooks, which is basically event driven code uh, and orchestrator has these options available to you. And our recommendation is whether you, whether or not you use hooks as your intermezzo between proxy SQL and orchestrator, you should always be using them to some extent, if for nothing other than for failure reporting, which is what it's going to do by default. Uh, it'll just put in the temp recovery log, um, but obviously you can modify that uh, if, if you uh, see, see it fit to do so. So in this case, we can use Orchestrator to leverage its hooks and say, hey, okay, well, we have a pre-failover hook. Maybe we want to say, okay, go ahead and remove that old uh, source host from proxy SQL. Okay, well, that's done. And we've done that update. So now we've taken down our replication host group size from three no from four nodes down to three. They're all replicas. Orchestrator is going to go. It's going to do its promotion. It set one of them to be the source server. And then it has its post failover hook where it can say, hey, okay, this one's a writer. We have success. We can go ahead and insert it into the host group for proxy SQL. We can disable its read-only flag, which Orchestrator was going to do anyway, but we can have some extra code just to make sure it's going to work and everything's fine. The obvious thing we have to point out is this is a solution that's going to be dependent upon code that you are going to have to supply. And as such, you have to test this as much as you possibly can before implementing in production. So one other big caveat here is that hooks only fire once in Orchestrator. Now that's not to say that you can't have code in your hook that retries until it can reach proxy SQL or until it can reach the MySQL host in question, but a lot of people aren't aware of this shortcoming, so they don't take that into consideration when they're writing their hooks. So you write your hook, it's only running once, it doesn't have any kind of loop in it, but proxy SQL isn't available. And you find yourself in the situation now that you were just a moment ago where you could be in that split brain. And this is why we're usually not a big fan of using hooks. We'll use it for some clients based off of their use case, but in a large majority of clients, we're going to use console to act as a layer between orchestrator and proxy SQL. And the good news is that orchestrator has native support for console and zookeeper, and it just uses a very, very simple key prefix in order to place information about the replication topology, specifically the master, but you can adjust it to also uh, put information in there for replicas as well. And that looks a little bit like what we see on this slide, where you're going to see something like MySQL slash master slash the, the alias name of your cluster, and then it'll provide information about the master in that key or set of keys. Again, the important thing here, going back to our previous is, example, is that you only have one key in console where it stores information about the master of your replication topology. So you can't have a situation where you have two hosts there because it can only store information for one. So as the, as, as the replication topology changes, you don't have to worry about that split brain scenario so long as you have something connecting console and the proxy SQL, so it receives that update. So it's either gonna have one previous old master or it's going to have the new source. See, I accidentally mixed up those terms again. It happens a lot. So before we go back for more questions, I do want to do a little bit more on console. Uh, for those of you who are familiar, it is a, um, it, it's a tool commonly used for service discovery. It is an amazing tool. I've used it for other purposes. But in this case, we're really just using it as a super lightweight, cluster-capable key value store. This is how we're eliminating the single point of failure for this storage of metadata. We're reliant once again on that raft consensus protocol. And also, given that we're going to have three console nodes, because you want to have at least three in your cluster, 
and we're going to have at least three orchestrator hosts, we eliminate yet another single point of failure by installing these on the same server. That way, as replication topology changes occur, we don't need to worry about network connectivity between orchestrator and console. It's just going right over 127.0.0.1. Similarly, on proxy SQL, we're going to have leverage console, but we're going to leverage it by installing the console agent, which eliminates the single point of failure. So to speak, it's like if I go directly to one of the servers in console and I say, hey, I need to get more information about what's going on in my replication topology, if that server goes away, well, then you're in trouble, right? Because obviously you can't reach it. You now have a single point of failure. But if you have the console agent locally installed with your proxy SQL host, it now is acting as a participating member of the cluster. It's not going to act as a server. It's just a client, but it knows where all the servers are. And so long as you have enough servers available to have quorum for your console cluster, you will still be able to parse those changes that are coming in from Orchestrator. More specifically for our proxy SQL hosts, we're leveraging console template. This is an extension of Go template, and it's what's going to happen when a change occurs in console. Console template fires, it reads the template file, it generates the new SQL file that proxy SQL can read, and then change its uh, configuration accordingly. So, Console is what we like to refer to as our source of truth. Assuming that everything has been configured correctly, you should always be able to go back to console and say, hey, what is the current state of my replication topology? And we're talking a lot about high availability, and this isn't something that's referenced in my slides, but there is a lot of other things you can do once you have a source of truth for your data platform. For example, I actually have a blog post where I said, hey, a lot of people are using Ansible now for process orchestration or to have you know, uh, infrastructure as code. You can use a source of truth to build inventory files that change on the fly. And this is something that's been a challenge for us in the past as we've been writing code in Ansible when we're dealing with uh, client environments where we're dealing with um, literally hundreds of replication topologies. And we need to make sure our inventory file is up to date and representative of the current state of those topologies prior to running any kind of playbook against it. This is another way that a source of truth is incredibly valuable. So once again, just recapping on that metadata flow, we have replication running in MySQL. As the situation changes or as disaster occurs, we have orchestrator there to get the topology back up and running. Once that's done, it's actively communicating to console locally on the same server to report any kind of changes that have occurred. Console has its records updated, which triggers console template, which generates the new SQL file, which proxy SQL file can read, and suddenly now everything is uh, completely taken care of. And it's 100% transparent. I mean, like the, the application is completely unaware that anything ever went wrong. You're, you're probably going to get a few uh, failed requests. Um, but still, for the most part, the application is unaware. In fact, actually, we've had situations with one of our very high traffic retail clients in the European market. Uh, they implemented this. They had a failure of their source. It recovered, and the application never experienced a single error. So. Uh, we find the situation to be very robust, very responsive, very fast, and it seems to meet the needs for a lot of our clients. So once again, just to kind of cover, we have our orchestrator and our console RAF clusters. They're monitoring MySQL, and they're actively pushing traffic up to our proxy SQL hosts. And from the application side, all it has to do is hit that endpoint, and it will reliably get down to uh, one of the MySQL hosts based off of the state of the replication topology. So I know that this is a pretty short slide deck. I wanted to make sure we had roughly about half time uh, left for questions and also for a demo. So before I get into the demo, does anybody have any questions about the solution as a whole? Would it uh, work across uh, data centers in a DR uh, type of configuration? I am so glad you asked. We're going to get to that in the demonstration.
Okay. Actually, very glad you asked. Does anybody else have any questions before we answer Bill's question? I have perhaps a simple question, and I'm just wondering, are Maria DB and MySQL synonymous, or? So yeah, this can work with MariaDB. Um, it can also work with Percona and MySQL. Perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. Percona has similar pro, uh, solutions for these uh, with Tungsten. Um, what's the advantage of this solution over, if you're already in the Percona ecosystem over say Tungsten? So um, to be clear, Tungsten is a continuant product. Uh, Percona doesn't really actively have any real engagement with it. Um, continuant Tungsten is a competitor of this. The main reason why I'm more drawn to this is more so because with this solution, we can take advantage of better parallel replication inside of MySQL. So it really doesn't have to do with the high availability stack so much as it has to do with replication performance. And I have to be really, really careful when I say that, because if you're using something like MySQL 5.6, continuant tungsten is still something that you can consider, right? It's, it, it's basically a, a solution that takes a lot of these concepts and packages it into one, right? But if you're using 5.6, the parallel replication features, while there are some there, the really good features weren't implemented until 5.7, I want to say 5.7.2.6 or 5.7.2.7. I'm really, really bad with minor versions. Um, and that's where you start getting into transaction right set extraction, which allows for much better parallel replication. And I would posit that the performance that you will see out of MySQL transaction right set extraction based parallel replication would exceed what you would see in Tungsten. I also have to be honest in the sense that I'm personally not a huge fan of Tungsten. I have found the documentation to be lacking and the syntax to be unintuitive. That's not to say it's a bad product, it's just not my product of choice. And that really doesn't carry a lot of weight in this conversation because I will fully admit that that is a personal preference, but I still think that the replication processing ability of parallel replication in 5.7 and 8.0 uh, is something definitely worth testing. So. If you were to compare this side by side with Tungsten, I would do it in 5.7, and I would take the time to do some serious A-B testing uh, between native parallel replication and uh, the transaction history logging based replication that you'd find in Tungsten. Thank you. No problem. Okay, so before we start a demonstration, I do want to let you know that obviously things are looking a little bit different here. Uh, the reason being is that during the original presentation, we did run into some technical difficulties with the demonstration, and the Greater Toronto Area Linux User Group has been kind enough to allow me to supply them with a recording after the fact, uh, allowing me to demonstrate these technologies in real time so you can see how effective these are. So let's take a look at the lab that we're going to be working with for our demo. Now, this is an extension of all the logic we've been talking about up to this point when it comes to this particular technology stack. And this is also meant to kind of show what's possible with this. As the client in question that I built this out for had specified that they wanted to take this, but they wanted to make it uh, data center fault tolerant. So we have a situation here where we have two data centers, the pink and the yellow one. Uh, they both have their own proxy SQL hosts, they both have their own MySQL hosts, and they both have their own orchestrator hosts. Now, as we already know, based on the limitations of MySQL and how we can write to individual hosts, we know that preferably only one host will be serving as the source host for our topology. And as we can see here, it's in the pink data center. It's sending information to other replicas within its own data center, and it's sending uh, information via replication to uh, replicas that are sitting over in the other data center. Now, another thing that's specific to this configuration was the request that any read traffic that comes to the proxy SQL hosts should only send traffic to replicas that exist within its own data center. So as we can see here, information going in, or sorry, requests going in through the uh, through the read port in proxy SQL is being forwarded to replicas within the same data center. Write traffic is going to the source host in the other data center because obviously write traffic can only go to one host and that's sitting in the other data center, so there's no two ways around that. Similarly, this is also occurring on uh, the pink data center as well.
Okay, so you'll see here also that we have orchestrator sitting in the pink data center and the yellow data center, but also in this third green data center. The reason for this is that orchestrator and console are both working with the RAF consensus protocol. As such, there has to be a majority of nodes available in the case of a failure so that it can still establish quorum and can continue running. So for example, uh, as a counterexample rather, if we had one orchestrator host sitting in the pink data center and two sitting in the second data center, that's fine if the pink data center goes down as we still have two nodes sitting in data center two. However, if data center two were to fail in that case, we'd only have one orchestrator node sitting in data center one, quorum would be lost, console would stop taking requests, orchestrator would stop taking requests, etc., etc. So in order to get around this, we have a third data center that is hosting our third orchestrator and console host. That way it doesn't matter which data center fails, there will always be two hosts available, quorum will remain established, and then that way it can still respond to failures. So uh, the earlier question that I had is, is this something that is uh, data center fault tolerant? In this case, it is, and let's go ahead and demonstrate that. So if we go into orchestrator, we have our OSDB lab cluster, and it, you can see the, here the uh, diagram that orchestrator has created for us is representative of that of what we know of the replication topology. We have a single source, we have four replicas, they're divided between two data centers, and in the case of Orchestrator, it's telling us that by using different color highlighting around the nodes. Those that are in orange are in data center one, those that are in blue are in data center two. Let's go to console and see what it's showing us. In our key value, we can go to MySQL, master, the alias name for our cluster, and we go to the host name and it's gonna say, hey, here's your master, MySQL one, we know this to be true, everything's looking great. Let's go to our replicas for the alias of our uh, cluster. And we can see here that the four nodes are present. Now this is being pushed in by a replica crawler script that's being run once a minute. So this may be a little bit slower to update, but the replica crawler script that we're using is expanded to provide metadata such as data center. As you can see, the MySQL2 node is in data center one. This is reflecting what we see in Orchestrator, and it's also reflecting what we know to be the truth uh, based off of how we've set up this lab environment. So when we fail data center one, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna have uh, Orchestrator and console maintaining its quorum. It'll recognize that MySQL one is down. It won't be able to query two and three because they're down, but it will be able to query four and five to say, hey, can you still see if MySQL one is up? They'll both report the replication failure it'll start taking action. It'll pick one of these two nodes to become the new uh, source of replication. It will set the remaining node to replicate from the new source. It will update console with the new information and console will subsequently update proxy SQL and data center two to make sure it's aware of the new topology. So let's go ahead and give that a shot. I'm gonna start by going over the orchestrator window and let's pull up my terminal. Okay, so now let's go ahead and get started with the actual uh, failure here. So let's just show what we have, again, using Docker Compose. We have all of our nodes, they're all up. Let's go ahead and kill them. Uh, specifically, let's kill the ones that are in data center one. So I'm gonna do MySQL one, MySQL two, MySQL, oops, helps if I spell it correctly, MySQL two, MySQL three, orchestrator, one, proxy SQL one, and proxy SQL two. Let's go ahead and kill it. Okay, we can see here that Docker has killed these nodes. Let's go ahead and see what Orchestrator did. Okay, so it's selected five to be the new replication source. It's configured four to replicate from five. And at this point, it looks like uh, the, the replication recovery has completed. One thing I wanna make a quick note of before we actually go to console is all recoveries have an anti-flapping measure and we need to make sure that's acknowledged. So we're gonna go to audit, recovery, and we're going to acknowledge that failure with very, very creative and descriptive text. 
And now, in, if another failure occurs, it can recover, where had we not acknowledged that recovery, had another failure occurred, it would have done nothing because it would have assumed that it was flapping and it doesn't want to take that action. So let's go back to our cluster. And now let's see what information it passed to console. So we're going to go to MySQL, master, the cluster, oop, sorry, wrong key. Let's go to hostname. And as we can see here, MySQL 5 is recognized as the new master. Now I think it's been about a minute since we've run uh, the disaster, so let's go ahead and see if the replicas are updated as well. As we can see here, it recognizes that MySQL 4 is the only replica. So everything seems to, to have uh, occurred as expected. Let's go ahead and check out what's going on with proxy SQL here. So yeah, looks like I don't have that immediately available. Let me copy that from my lab. As we can see here, the writer host group has been altered so it only consists of MySQL 5. The local reader host group has been revised so it only consists of MySQL 4. Let's try this with an actual request. Remember we have 6033 noted as our writer endpoint. And as we can see, requests going through that writer are now going to MySQL 5 as expected.